Uh, we are starting a new series on the book of Philippians. Uh, go ahead and open to Philippians. Last week, uh, we read through Paul's second missionary journey and his stay at Philippi. Uh, I want to give you just a little bit of background as to what this city was all about. Philippi was named after uh, Philip II of Macedonia. Does anybody know who that is? Well, he's the one the city's named for. Uh, Philip II was Alexander the Great's father. Okay. Um, he uh, put together all of the disparate parts of Macedonia and uh, had eyes, was actually looking at going down and, and taking Greece when he died. Uh, and uh, his son, Alexander, stepped in and became one of the, the most known people in the Western world, uh, even, even known in the Eastern world. Um, Philippians, if you would go ahead and put that first slide up. Okay, Philippi, you see it up at the top, it's a greenish <coughs> color. Uh, if you look over in the top right corner, you see Istanbul. Um, Philippi is in what today uh, would be Turkey, and it sits, go ahead and put the second one up. Uh, if you watch the, the yellow line, I put a couple of black arrows that uh, appear to have disappear. Uh, one in the bottom left corner, that's uh, Thessalonica, and then the trade route is the yellow line that goes through there, and up in the, the top right, uh, you can see, well, actually, you can't see. The arrow, yeah, the arrow's not, the arrow is not pointing where it should be. Uh, if you look at the top, or the, the furthest over red dot, uh, just a little to the north and a little to the east of that is Philippi. And it was positioned in an excellent spot for trade and also for the military. That's why it became so important. Um, Philip conquered it. Uh, it was, had a great agricultural uh, environment. Um, they found uh, some years later uh, that there were there was gold near there. It became a significant city under uh, the Greeks, and um, it was conquered by the Romans when the Romans, uh, the Third Macedonian War, it was conquered by the Romans in 168 BC, and it pretty much disappears from history after that until. Um, Julius Caesar died, and if you remember uh, any of your, your history on Rome, um, those who assassinated uh, Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar, uh, went to war with his um, adopted son, Octavius, who was allies with Mark Antony. Uh, the great culmination of that struggle took place on the plains just to the west of Philippi. And that's when Octavius uh, really consolidated his power. We see a few years uh, later that he and Mark Antony war. He defeats Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Um, shortly after that, he is given the title Augustus, uh, which means venerated, uh, which, which means that he is to be worshiped. Um, we see that he placed a great significance in Philippi, so much so that after he was named Augustus, he actually, uh, after the battle, he settled a number of the older men from the army in that city, and he made that city a colony of Rome. Now, we don't really 
uh, we're, we're very far removed from being a colony. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the, Civil, or the Revolutionary War happened is because England wanted us, declared us to be a colony, but then did not treat with us as though we were full citizens uh, of England. Um, when you are a colony, your mother country gives to you inherent rights as part of that nation. And so when Rome um, made Philippi a, a colony, the people that lived there became Roman citizens. And why, why is that significant? Because there were inherent rights to being a Roman citizen that other people, those that were conquered, were part of the, the empire. They were not Roman citizens. We know from Acts that uh, you could become a Roman citizen in other ways, but typically it involved a lot of money. Um, you could, through other means, become a Roman citizen. We know that uh, Paul made use of his citizenship to uh, prevent being beaten um, on at least one occasion. On a second occasion, uh, he was beaten, and then he, we read this in Acts chapter 16, uh, he declared his citizenship and <coughs> required that the leaders of Philippi come and apologize and escort him out of the city. And, and they had to do that because he was a citizen. He was somebody of value in the empire, okay? So, um, the fact that this little uh, town is a colony and they are given the full rights of the Roman Empire, Roman citizenship, places them in a unique place in Macedonia. Um, because uh, there were not that many places outside of Rome that got the rights of being a Roman citizen. Now, I told you that they found gold there. Uh, Philippi was a very wealthy city. It sat right on the major trade route from Europe going into Asia Minor. So people passed back and forth. Uh, that brought trade. There was a, a, a gold was found near there. There were mines that, that gold was being uh, taken out of. Uh, we saw in Acts that they had some access to um, at least the, the purple dye, uh, which, which is extremely rare at that time, uh, and so much so that you did not dare wear purple unless you were a certain uh, strata of the, of the country, and that your place in society determined whether or not you could even wear purple. And the more purple you wore, the higher up in the society you were. So if you saw somebody with a lot of purple on them, uh, that meant one of two things. One, they were high up in the nation, or two, they're going to get killed. Uh, because it was not something that you could treat frivolously. It was like a badge of honor. Um, so, couple notes. Uh, last week we talked about Paul and Silas uh, establishing the church in Philippi. I would encourage you as we go through this study, periodically go back there and see what all happened with the establishment of the church because this is the first church on the continent of Europe. Okay? And the first convert on the continent of Europe was a woman. And that's huge for this time. Okay? Uh, that is a... a big thing because you look at Paul and Silas who are coming out of Judaism and to, to speak to a woman uh, that was not family was verboten. Um, that's why when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well, she was twice cursed, one because she was a woman and the second because she was a Samaritan woman. Um, and that's why the disciples were amazed at what he was doing. But Paul and Silas they go out and they start talking to this woman and she is also twice cursed because she is a woman and because she is a Gentile. So for them to communicate with her, this is opening up a huge door for the Christian church. 
Because now uh, we, we're not just limited to the, the synagogues. As a matter of fact, um, they didn't even go to the synagogue when they came into Philippi. If you look at the first missionary journey, the first place they went when they got to any city with Paul and Barnabas was the synagogue. God spoke to Paul and said, you're not going to be uh, an evangelist, a witness to the Jews. And you think about that, what an amazing uh, call that God had because you look at Peter and you look at Paul and it really makes so much more sense that Paul would be uh, the, the apostle sent to the Jews because he knew it. He lived it. He was advancing in faith beyond his years. He could argue with them the ups and the downs and the sideways about the faith. But no, God chose Peter a fisherman whose education in the law and the prophets would have ended about the age of 12. Remember, God says he takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Okay? Um, that's another good reason I'm not God, because I would have messed that whole thing up. Uh, but Paul goes to the Gentiles. And, and this is a man who trained from a very early age. Uh, we know he studied under Gamaliel, who was considered one of the premier rabbis of that age. And not just of that age, they still look back on his writings today. They still look for his wisdom today. Paul studied under him. But God said, I'm not going to send you to the Jews. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. So the, the Sabbath comes, and instead of going to synagogue, Paul and Silas and, and Timothy and uh, Luke, they go out to the river uh, to find a place to pray. And, and they come across this woman, and they share with her, and she accepts what they have to say. She, it, the scripture says that uh, she, was, um, <clears throat> she knew God. And so I don't know how that worked uh, because we don't really know a lot about Philippi, the, the establishment of the Jews in Philippi. Scripture doesn't really tell us a whole lot. Most likely there was a community there. Uh, most likely there was a synagogue there. Um, but somehow or another, she came to know about the one true God. And when they came in, they brought the message of the gospel that the Messiah had come. This was the fulfillment of what she knew that God had promised. Now, how much she knew, I don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. And, and I think that's important because we don't need to know. A lot of times we can get tripped up on the details and miss the, the big picture. But um, she was baptized and all of her household as well. So um, we see that the, the church is now established on the continent of Europe. Uh, it was very much God's will, uh, because right before Paul and Silas went to Macedonia, they were actually planning on going up further north and, and witnessing up there, uh, but God told them no. God said, don't go there. As a matter of fact, it says an angel prevented them from going there. And then Paul was given a vision in a dream, uh, a man in Macedonia calling to him and saying, come to us. And so they went, and it, you know, we never find out if the man was a real man, and, and Paul got to meet him at some point, or if that was an angelic uh, person that, that appeared as a man to have him move over. But I find it somewhat interesting that it was a man that got him to go over, the dream about the man that got him to go over, but the first person that becomes a Christian is a woman. Okay? Uh, God is so cool. So... Um, let's, let's take a little bit of a look about this book. Uh, we do know from the writing in the book um, that Paul was in prison at the time. Uh, we believe this is probably somewhere around 60 to 64 um, AD. Uh, we believe that this is not uh, the Mamertine imprisonment. We believe this was when Paul was in house arrest. Um, several other passages or letters were written at this same time. Um, we know that, that Paul had freedom in some extent to continue his work even though he was 
imprisoned. We know that people were able to come and minister to his needs. He was able to send people out to minister to the needs of other congregations. Uh, Philippians, um, one of the things that you really have got to know about Philippians is that it's unique in all of Paul's epistles because his purpose for writing to the Philippians is not correction. His purpose in writing to the Philippians is not to expound in, in great detail uh, anything about the Christian faith. He does do those things, but that's not the focus. The focus, the purpose of why he's writing is to tell them thank you for partnering with him. And, and he wants to let them know how he's doing. You know, it's uh, a lot like the kidders when they would come back, or the McDaniels, when they come back and they visit with us and they get to share those things that have been going on in their ministry. He's writing a letter to give them their update. This is what's going on. And so a couple of key things stand out. Uh, before we go much further, we got to start with the book. So we're going to read it. And I say we, meaning I'll read it, and you follow. <laughs> Unless somebody else wants to come up and read. I'm okay with that. Dang. <laughs> All right. So, greeting. Philippians 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of the partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ." filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. <coughs> yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as uh, always, Christ will, honor, will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, that I may hear of you, and that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side, 
for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also, also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being in the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will also come. I have thought it necessary to send to you at Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all, and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men." For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself has reason, have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing 
Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lie, lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if, any of you th if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eurodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord, Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have re revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being in need, uh, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek a gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift, the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. 
The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now, did any particular thing stand out here that, that is consistent throughout this uh, epistle? <clears throat> What's that? Rejoice. Rejoice. That's actually the key to this entire epistle. Uh, the word joy in any of its form is found no less than 14 and uh, maybe as many as 16 times depending on the, 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 the translation that you have, the word joy is used. Uh, four chapters and yet 14 to 16 times this, this phrase is used. Um, Paul is really <coughs> exuberant in expressing joy to the church in Philippi. Um, one of the other things that uh, is unique about this, this epistle is that it is the only epistle that Paul wrote that we know of that uh, he doesn't quote the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, I, I think because his intent here is not to establish doctrine or to rebuke or reprove, uh, I think he's writing this letter as an encouragement. And, and what a great thing that that would be, that he would write uh, such an encouraging letter to this church and, and the things that uh, they have done to help him in his ministry. And we'll get into this more as we go through and we, we break this down section by section. Um, one of, uh, of the other things that Paul really stresses in this epistle is um, the vigorous type of Christ living that the church should have. Uh, this, this should be active and being engaging and not passive. Uh, there, there is so much uh, in Christ for us to do and to know. Um, it also contains one of the most significant passages of Christology in the New Testament. Now, Christology just being a fancy word for the study of Christ or the knowing of Christ. Uh, and, and that's in chapter 2 where he explains... Uh, how we should live by using Christ as our model and how Christ modeled this for us. Um, and yet he only uses this to illustrate. He's not using it as a teaching point. He's using it as an illustration for how Christians should live their lives. Um, so, Church at Philippi, we see established in uh, Acts chapter 16. Um, we see a little bit, actually we see quite a bit of, of further information in this epistle as Paul is bringing to their remembrances uh, and, and presenting to the things that, that they have done on his behalf and in the church. Um, we, we come across a number of characters that we've seen in other uh, passages, in other books. Uh, we, we come across Epaphroditus, um, who we see in a couple other of his passages. We come across Timothy, who Paul declares to be his spiritual son. Um, that's it for today. I want to encourage you, please. Don't just read the book. I want you to start making notes. Uh, uh, if you uh, write in your Bible, make notes in your Bible. If you don't write in your Bible, get a journal, get a, get a book that you can put things, you know, as you're reading and God pops something into your mind or something stands out to you. Jot it down. Um, I want us to dig deep into this book. Um, because I think this is, um, I think this is a book that is especially encouraging to the church. Uh, Paul addresses two issues 
in this that are going on in the church, just as he did in the book of Colossians. In Colossians, he dealt with the Judaizers and the Gnostics. Uh, in Philippians, he deals with the Judaizers again. And he also uh, deals with the anti-Nominians, um, those who practice cheap grace. They sin the more that grace may abound the more. Um, and both of these we see he deals with in others of his letters. So I want you to just, just kind of go through and, and take note of, of what Paul is saying and how that fits into the, the whole scope of what God is doing in the church. Father, we thank you for this day and this time of uh, fellowship, this time of worship. We thank you, Father, for your word. I ask that you would open our minds that we might understand, that, Father, we would grow in wisdom. Uh, Father, that we would not be content uh, to just let our eyes move over the page or let our mouths quote the words, but, Father, that this would be rooted deep into our soul, that, Father, we would, we would nourish ourselves from the words in this book. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.